Welcome, everybody. Of course, it was daylight savings time. You got an extra hour of sleep, but some of your neighbors still look sleepy. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, wake up, wake up, because it's on. We got to get the word of God. Amen. I know it's cold in Florida. That is crazy. I know it's cold, but it's okay. I believe there are showers of blessing in here, and the presence of the Lord is in this place. Today, we are continuing our series called Change the World. Somebody shout, change the world. And today, we are on part six of our series. If you missed any of the first five parts, make sure that you jump onto the podcast, the Alive Church app, or the website. We believe faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the more you hear God's word the more you'll see your faith develop with the church. Say amen. Amen. And if you have a Bible, please go with me over to John chapter 4. You should already know. It contains a story about what we call the Samaritan woman or the woman by the well. And this has been like our passage that we've been building around. And this passage is anointed, y'all. I love this story. There is something powerful about this story, and there's also a spirit of evangelism on this story. And I believe there's a spirit of evangelism in this house, and I want that spirit of evangelism to hit your home. Would somebody say amen to this? The story about the Samaritan woman um, is a story about a woman who affects and infects an entire city with her faith. Not because she's a perfect woman. She's had five husbands, so she's been around. Not because she's the right gender or the right race. The Bible says the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Um, but simply because she had a personal encounter with Jesus. She met Jesus, and she couldn't keep him to herself. And she had this one thing that we all need, enthusiasm. She didn't have a theological degree. She didn't go to Jerusalem University to tell people about Jesus. See, some of y'all think that you have to go to more classes to tell people about Jesus. She, She wasn't saved for a long time. Matter of fact, she had just met Jesus that day. And she went out and told everybody in the city, and I love her one punchline, come and see. Sharing your faith is not difficult. You just got to be willing to go out into the highways and byways and tell people, come and see. John chapter 4 starts this way, and we're going to read some today. I just believe we should read the Bible some when we come to church. Are y'all good? And hopefully when you go home, you're looking at John 4 in your Devo time in your first 15, and really unpack John 4. I mean, look in different translations of John 4. Read like the Message Bible, you know, look at the NIV, the NLT, look at different, look at different words in John 4. John 4, verse 1, it says, and when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and just go along with me, y'all there, verse 2, although Jesus himself didn't baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and he departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus wearied. Everybody say he was wearied. Y'all know what that means. He was tired. He didn't feel like dealing with folks, right? He's tired. He was tired from his journey. He's sitting by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, 12 o'clock noon. A woman from Samaria, she came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews, they don't want nothing to do with us. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us this well and he drank from it himself and his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everybody who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again. The water I give will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't be thirsty and I won't need to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, I love this, go call your husband and tell him to come here. And the woman answered, I I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. You ain't got no husband for you have five husbands. And the one you with now is not even your husband. So what you said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet, progressions. And our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. And Jesus dropped revelation. He says, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in the synagogue or in a church where you need to worship for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is, is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father, y'all with me, is seeking such people to worship him. Let's read on. God is spirit, 
And those who worship him must worship him, what? In spirit and in understanding. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who's called the Christ. And when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I'm on the scene. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking to a woman. But nobody said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away to the town. And this is what she told the people. Come on, y'all. Underline verse number 29. Highlight verse number 29. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I got food that you don't know about. So the disciples said, has anybody brought him something to eat? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him. Ooh, this is what I want my assignment to be. To do the will of him who sent me and accomplish the work. Don't say there's yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. There are so many things that we can take out of John 4. And like I said, I hope that you go home and you do a little due diligence. You begin to meditate on the scripture yourself and don't wait to just hear it when you come to church. But there's a few things that I take out of John chapter 4 today that I would love you to take notes and kind of write down. Number one, what I learned from John 4 today is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are an important part of evangelism. Would somebody say amen? Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you go through our growth track course that we do after every Sunday, we basically go through every gift um, gift in the Bible, which is about 28 different gifts, I think, something like that. But the nine gifts of the Spirit found in 1 Corinthians 12 is what we call sign gifts. Everybody say sign gifts. And we typically break these gifts into three categories. There's revelation gifts, there's power gifts, and there's also vocal gifts, okay? Um, The gifts are very important because the gifts are needed to reach a dying world. You don't just need a natural encounter where you're trying to debate with people with information. You need the power of God to show up. And so the Bible tells us that we should covet the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know sometimes you say, well, that's for the pastor, pastor, the bishop, or the reverend. I want you to know that it's for every born-again believer that there should be gifts of the Holy Spirit that we develop in and we begin to grow in because the world needs the light. They, they need to see the power of God flowing through us. And these gifts of the Holy Spirit are really not just for the church. I know people come to church and they want the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be here, but they're actually better outside the walls of the church When you're in the classroom and in the boardroom or whatever room you happen to be in, God wants you to flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So my hope from this day forward is that that will pique your interest where you begin to covet and desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit because that's what the Bible says. But the gift of the Spirit that we see Jesus operating in is one of the revelation gifts that we call the word of knowledge. Please write that down. In the revelation gifts, we have the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. And so Jesus comes up on her, and he's like, listen, you've had five husbands. So the word of knowledge, write this down, is when the Holy Spirit gives you divine insight that you could not naturally know about something in the past or something in the present. So here Jesus comes, and he says, you've had five husbands, not to guilt her, not to shame her, not for her to be in condemnation, but for her to realize that the kingdom of God is at hand. See, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for you to get in pride to lift yourself up, but it's for you to lift up the name of Jesus. When God shows you something about somebody else, it's not to guilt them or shame them or make them feel bad. It's only to bring them closer to the heart of God. So we see this as an important part of evangelism. Number two, what we take from John 4 is that evangelism is fueled by love. It's fueled by love. It is the foundation in which all of your evangelism, you say, Pastor, I've never shared my faith before. Maybe it's because you don't love enough yet. Because when you get so full of the love of God, you can't keep this to yourself. So we see Jesus in John 4 being a bridge builder and a barrier breaker, meaning that he's going to build the bridge to reach people that other people would not, and he's going to break down the barriers. So he teaches us to love people that others shun. He teaches us to love people that others hate. He teaches us to love people that others don't want absolutely nothing to do with. Those who've been rejected by society, abandoned and left, Jesus teaches us to love those people. And the greatest gift that you could give your family this Christmas is not new underwear, not a tie or socks. It's the gift of salvation. Think about it for a second. 
The greatest gift that you could give the people this Christmas that you say you love is a conversation about their eternal soul, is a conversation about the gift of eternal life. Don't give them something that's going to fade away and have holes in it in 12 months. I know sometimes we go through it. We're at Bath, Bed Bath and Beyond, and we're just like, well, I'm just going to get them. You get them crap. Like $15, because you know we do gift exchanges. How many of y'all do gift exchanges? And everybody has a limit. It's like $25. So you out there trying to find something for $25. And we all just exchange gifts. I'm going to get you a $25 gift certificate to Outback Steakhouse, and you're going to get me one to Red Lobster. And we're going to come in with twinkles in our eyes and say, Merry Christmas, as we exchange these $25 gifts. But I want to give people eternal life. I want to give them healing and deliverance and power. The, great, the gift that keeps on giving is the risen king. Is anybody with me today? I came to preach on a cold November Sunday. And number three, this is what we learned from John 4. If you're ready, say, I'm ready, is that evangelism is inconvenient. Please write that down. Evangelism is inconvenient. And I want you to hold that thought for a moment, and we're going to build from there today. But first, let's define evangelism. What is evangelism, class? Ready, go. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm going to help you. Very simply, write this down, is telling others about the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel is good news. So evangelism is telling other people good news. When you turn on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, you don't get good news. We the ones that got good news. And it's sad to see us as God's chosen people keep that news to ourselves because we scared of people when we got good news. And this world is in need of some good news. The gospel is good news. And evangelism is not sharing that people are going to hell and they're bad people. It's saying that there is a God that loves you so much that got on a rugged cross over 2,000 years ago, and he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. And salvation is for you and for you and for you and to everybody who wants to call on the name of the Lord. Somebody shout, that's good news. And so I love to share the gospel, but what I found out is that the average Christian doesn't even really know the gospel. Like, that's the gospel in the simplest form is sharing the good news. That's what evangelism is. But the average Christian, if you ask them, they would not be able to articulate. And so what I'm asking you to do in this series is, like, to go home and, like, get, evan- like get the gospel in your heart. Like, be able to repeat it to me. If I was like, hey, Brandon, share with me the gospel. Like, you would have something. It ain't like, I don't know. I don't know, pastor. No, I want you to be able to have something. So I'll give you mine, and you can steal mine if you want. This is, this is what I would say. What's the gospel? This is it. You ready? In 30 seconds. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So all human beings deserve hell. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. The definition of grace is favor you don't deserve, meaning that it's favor that you can't earn. So while everybody else is trying to climb their way into heaven, Jesus came out of heaven and he pulled us up to himself. God loves us so much that he put his only begotten son on the cross. I got a son. I'm not putting him on the cross for you. God's love is greater than my love. God loves you so much that he gave you a free will. That means that you don't have to accept Jesus. You can reject Jesus and worship the pole, the lights, the moon, or whatever else you want to worship because God won't make you accept him. What he does is he gives you a choice. He says, I lay before you life and death, the blessings and curses. And he says, listen here, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm trying to nudge you to choose life so that you and your seed can live. Hell is not the place that God sends people that he's mad at. Hell is the place that people go when they want to pay for their own sin. God doesn't send people to hell. Hell was never created for for people. It was created for the devil and a third of the angels that rebelled against God. But now when you use your own will to reject the Savior's plan, you send yourself to a devil's hell that you was never supposed to go to. Come on, somebody. Salvation is easy. And I got one scripture, Romans 10, 9. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'd be saved. Salvation is not being a perfect person. It's being a surrendered one that believes in your heart, confesses with your mouth that what Jesus did on the cross was just for you, and that is good news. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Come on online. Come on, put in the chat right now, and that is, that's good news. That is good news. 
So ain't none of us good enough to get to heaven. But thank God it's not based upon my goodness but his. And he was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Would somebody say amen? amen. So simply put, evangelism is telling people the good news. Furthermore, you do not have to be an evangelist to evangelize. You don't have to have all of the answers to evangelize. And you don't have to have it all together. The Samaritan woman, she didn't have it all together, but she still evangelized. But you do have to be willing to be inconvenienced. Today's message is entitled Inconvenient Evangelism. And what I found out is that it's not really the devil or demonic forces stopping the church from evangelizing. It's our unwillingness to be inconvenienced. And your unwillingness to be inconvenienced for God is not only hindering the people that you say that you love, it's actually stopping God's best from coming into your life. This segment jumped into my heart about two months ago. I was having a conversation with our executive pastor, Scott Maccabee, and I said, man, how's your week going? What you got planned for this week? And he says, I'm praying and asking God to inconvenience me this week. I said, what'd you say? <laughs> because it was right in the middle of our building project. He was already up to 10, 11 o'clock at night trying to get this building open. And it, and it stuck out to me. He was praying, asking God, God, inconvenience me this week. Now, how many of y'all have ever prayed that prayer? We got two super holy people this is. You, you just lifted your hand because you thought I was going somewhere else. Just because I lifted mine, you lifted yours. You ain't never prayed that prayer. Stop it. If we're honest, most of us, our prayer life is God, make my day easy. <laughs> Please remove all the difficulties and inconveniences out of my path, oh Lord, while I stand under the showers of blessing, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much, right? Nobody's like God inconvenience me, right? That's not like on the top of my prayer chain. But this one thing I do pray. I say this. this it's a simple prayer. I say, God, put somebody in my life today that I can tell about you. I find that this simple prayer brings great dividends. God, put somebody in my life this, today that I can tell about you. Now, if you pray that prayer... Get ready to be inconvenienced. It's very close to your prayer, God inconvenienced me. That means that you're in the Publix and you're thinking, I'm going to get this watermelon and roll. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is like, that lady right there, you need to go talk to her. And you don't waste the 20 minutes. I just wanted to get my melon, Jesus. I, I got things I got to do. You know, That's that time you got the lunch break. And you're thinking, man, I got an hour lunch break. I'm about to play some tunes and, just, and unwind just for an hour. And then the Lord's like, no. Take so-and-so to lunch and talk about their problems. And they're like, Jesus, I got my own problem. If you want a soul win, you got to get ready to be inconvenienced. It's really not about your time, and it's not about your schedule. People say, I ain't got time to serve. I ain't got time to do all this. You got to make time for what's important. Some of us don't have, God don't want, he wants to blow up your schedule. He wants to blow up your budget and put himself at the top of it. We try to fit God in, well, I ain't got time right now. You know, I got to play volleyball on Sundays. That's why I can't come, come to church. No, he don't want, he don't want that. He want to blow up your schedule, put him at the top and everything else second or third. <laughs> and so I double dog dare you to go home and say, God, inconvenience me this week. All right. And so here we are, guys. Our goal for today is for you to switch altars. Because many of us, we've been bowing down and worshiping at the altar of convenience. And God ain't there. And we love convenience. We love it. We love, we love comfort. Oh, we love ease. And we, love, we want our life to be easy, but the Bible never promised us that anything that God has called us to. The Bible says to carry your cross, but we want things to be easy. And so many times we are worshiping the idol of ease and comfort. Well, I'm just not comfortable. I'm an introvert. I just, I'm just not comfortable. What does your comfort zone got to do with the calling of God that is on your life and standing before the king, hearing him say, well done? And it's not supposed to be easy, and it's not supposed to be comfortable, and God knows it's not supposed to be convenient. But most of us, if we were honest, we bow down at this altar, and I want you to know that God ain't there. God is over at this altar. God is over here with difficulty. No, Jesus, I rebuke that in the name. God loves it when we're uncomfortable because that grows you. 
God loves it when you're inconvenienced and he has to destroy your schedule and your priority and relationships and make sure that he's at the top of everything that you want to do in your life. But most of us are worshiping at the wrong, at the wrong altar. And I believe what God is asking us to do today is to repent from the God of convenience because he's not a God of convenience. He's a God of inconvenience. And there's something about when you start worshiping at the right altar that you realize these things is what develops you. The things that you've been rebuking is the things that develop you. The difficulty in your life is making you stronger. The uncomfortability in your life is making you trust him more. The inconvenience in your life is purifying your priorities. And we got to shift altars. Would you tell somebody around you, you got to shift altars. You've been worshiping at the wrong altars. Who, who is that for today? That's the word in the house today. And so my assignment today is simple, to help us stop bowing the knee to the idols of convenience and to turn our direction and worship the God of inconvenience. Because anything that's worth anything is going to come with inconvenience. Yes. Marriage is inconvenient. Come on, somebody. Oh, my God. I always got to think about your feelings. I always got to check with you before I spend money. You need to know where I'm going all the time. I'm a grown dog on man. No, you a married man. You a married woman. Come on. Your life is not your own. Oh, y'all ain't even ready for this today. Marriage is for mature people. It ain't for babies. It's going to mess up your plans. I just wish I wouldn't have had them kids and went back to college, but you didn't. You had them babies. Now grow up and handle it. Parenting is inconvenient. All the parents said amen. amen. I got a 10-year-old little boy, and on conference week, the conference we've been planning for a decade, the man has an asthma flare-up, and my wife hadn't preached in a year because of overcoming breast cancer, so she in there, and she's studying, and he didn't have an asthma flare-up till midnight. I'm talking about the pediatrics are closed. The late night, PM pediatrics, they close at 10. I Googled it. If you would have been three hours earlier, we wouldn't have had to go to the ER. So here is, you know, my wife getting dressed in midnight, supposed to be studying, supposed to be resting. She's at the ER from midnight to 4 a.m. Parenting is inconvenient. Not only that, them kids, man, they'll come in 3 a.m. in the morning sniffling and coughing. They seen something in the corner. They want to come in. I'm like, I'm asleep. Leave me alone. Go rebuke it. I mean, use the name. <laughs> School teachers, they want to meet with you. Oh, we need to have a parent teaching conference. No, I don't want to come and talk to your teacher. I don't want to help you do your math. I don't want to fix you toast because that's, I don't want to do any of that. But you know what? As parents, we've accepted it. That as a parent, I'm going to be inconvenienced. And we are okay with it. But have we accepted the fact that as a Christian, you're going to be inconvenienced? Some of you all are rebelling against the inconvenience. Most of us, we need a church that's close to our house. God forbid God call us to a church that I got to drive to. You know, I just need my church to kind of be like within a mile radius of my house so that it can be as convenient as possible. God forbid, and I don't want the church to be too big. I can't find parking or too small. We don't have kids programming for my kids. I need it to be just, come on somebody, y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't let it be too hot in the sanctuary or too cold. And they just got it so cold. And we just need everything just to be like I want. And you've been worshiping at the wrong altar. And don't realize that God ain't there. God ain't, God ain't thinking about your temperature. God ain't thinking about how far you got to drive. God ain't thinking. He wasn't thinking that when he got on the cross. It wasn't a convenient cross. It was completely inconvenient for him to give his life and shed his blood. Come on, somebody. It was inconvenient to step out of heaven and to become a man. Oh, I'm getting choked. I'm so hyped up in this place today. And you've been worshiping at the wrong altar, and I'm saying, God, where is the power? Where is the glory? But we want church just like we like it, because if it ain't like it, we're going to go down to the church down the street, because we're shopping around for what we like, but God don't care what you like. He care what he like. He's the God of inconvenience. My hope for you today is that you're going to accept this, that when I decided to become a Christian to carry my cross, Everything's not going to fit in my schedule. I got to give God my schedule. 
So what we've learned is that walking with God is inconvenient. The Bible says it this way, Galatians 6, 2. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And what I found out is that people need you when they need you. Tragedy doesn't call you to set appointment. Like, hey, you know, are you free today? Because I'm going through this in my marriage or I was in a car accident. No, people need you when they need you. And when the Bible says to bear one another's burdens, that means that if you're going to be a Christian, get ready to be inconvenienced by faith. But I'm going to trust the Lord. God, are y'all hearing me today? Luke 9 and 10, I love this one because Jesus' disciples are out doing ministry. They're tired. You ever done ministry before and be a little tired? Like it's cold outside, but you had to come here at 6.45 for production or something like that, or you were at a rally at 8.30 this morning, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm here, but my feelings are following my choices. And It says in verse 10, on their return, the apostles told them all they had done, and he took them, and he withdrew apart to a town. So they're trying to get away. You ever needed to get away before? Like, Calgon, just take me away. I'm talking about you need a vacation. Like, I just, I just don't want to deal with people right now. I just need to. <laughs> so this is what's happening. He withdrew away from everybody else. But verse 11 says, when the crowds learned it, they followed him. Leave me alone just for a minute, right? And what did he do? He shunned them. He rejected them. He what? He what? He welcomed them. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he cured all them who had need of a healing. And now the day began to wear away. Think about it. They've been ministering for days. And now they're trying to get away, but they can't get away. And the 12 came, and they was like, please send them people home. So tell them to go into the surrounding villages and countryside so they can find a hotel or something and get some provisions so they can, man, get them, get them something to eat. And he said to them, you give them something to eat. Are you tripping, Jesus. Pastor, you want to start another campus already? We just got this one. You want to start another service already? We just trying to fill up this one. He said, go buy food for the people. For the, There were about 5,000 men. You ever try to feed 5,000 people? You need a few caterers for that. And they said, the disciple said, he said to them, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. And they did so. And he had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves, don't miss this, and the two fish, he looked up to heaven said a blessing over them, broke the loaves, and he gave it to the disciples, and they set it before the crowd, and he fed what estimated about 20,000 people with two fish, five loaves of bread. Here's the revelation. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Amen. That most miracles are birthed out of inconveniences. Yes. Are y'all hearing me today? Yeah. Most miracles are birthed out of inconveniences. God asks us to do something hard. Something where we have to give. Come on, Super Sunday. We have to give more than what we ever thought. He asks us to give up something of value for something that has greater value. Because he knows that when we shift everything and we rely on him, that is the ground for miracles to happen. God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. The son he'd been believing for for a 100 years. And when he did it, he provided a ram in the bush. And then he said, I'm going to make you the multitude of nations because the inconvenience gave birth to the... Are y'all with me today? God tells Moses to go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Inconvenience, he could have been killed. What happened? Millions of Israelites came out of Egypt, out of slavery into freedom because inconvenience gives birth to miracles. God tells Elisha, Why don't you go and follow Elijah? He destroys his family business. He leaves his family inconvenience. What happens? He qualifies for the double portion anointing. He does double the miracles of Elijah because miracles are already birthed, always birthed out of, can I go on? Jesus comes and he looks at his disciples in a boat. He says, why don't you drop your nets and follow me? Inconvenience. They leave their family, the fishing business. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. They become the apostles of the Lamb. They begin to do miracles, signs and wonders, because miracles are birthed out of inconveniences. What about Jesus? God said, I've given my only begotten son. Jesus goes to a cross. He dies a sinner's death for the inconvenient. What happens? 
Death couldn't hold him down. And on the third day, he rose with all power in his hands. And he says, oh, death, where is your sting? I am the, the life and the resurrection. And now he gives us the power to live an eternal life with him because miracles are always birthed out of inconveniences, all right? In 2005, Tabitha and I had a successful real estate business outside of Washington, D.C. Nice home, nice vehicles. We had just had a baby. I was in a church that I loved. I loved my pastor. I was on the board of directors of the church. We were loving life. And the Lord says, I've called you to be a pastor. I said, where? He says, Gainesville, Florida. I said, where is that? I had to Google it and figure out where it was. In 2005, I told my pastor, he says, you got about two years, and I'm going to release you in about two years, okay? What happens? We sold all of our real estate. We left our businesses. We left our family. We left the friends. We left the church that we, that we loved, and we started a church in a city that we did not know one person. What was that? Inconveniences. And out of those inconveniences, we've seen thousands of people saved, marriages restored, people healed of all kinds of different things. Come on, somebody, and we just getting started because miracles are always birthed out of inconveniences. In 2017, we're praying about expansion. The Lord says, I'm calling you to expand. I say, great, I'm going to send Pastor Aaron or Pastor somebody, I'm going to send them out to a different city. He says, no, send yourself. I said, no, Jesus, I'm, I have a nice house in Gainesville. We have an established ministry, seeing a thousand plus people every single Sunday. We're doing very well. And the Lord is like, no, um, I've called you to do more. I said, what about the people? What would the people think? What would the people say? What, would, how, what, what about the people? He says, what does the people got to do with it? Did people call you in the ministry or do I, did I call you in the ministry? And so I start looking at different cities, and he says, Orlando's where I've called you. And so now, instead of sending somebody else to start in the coffee shops and be faithful in Christ Church with a two and a four o'clock service, the lead pastor came and was completely inconvenienced. But from those inconveniences, we got a new building that we opened up last month. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. In October, hold on, hold on. In October, we saw 233 people come to Jesus. Come on, somebody. We just held our first annual Alive Conference. Come on, somebody. We've seen people healed of elbows and scoliosis. And, all. and I want you to know that we just now getting started because open heaven is here and open heaven is now. Woo! Glory to God. Because miracles are always birthed from inconveniences. But some of you all want to be so comfortable. And you need things to be so easy. And you need things to be so convenient that you're missing God because you're worshiping the idols of convenience. And God is saying that if you give me something that costs something to you, I'll give you something better. Yes. <laughs> so what is God asking us to do that's an inconvenience, but it's really the setup for miracles? A live conference is an inconvenience. We literally are asking you every October to take three days off work, really two and a half, spend money to buy a ticket, get babysitters for your kids, and drive or fly in from wherever you are so you can encounter God. You say that's inconvenient. Exactly. That's why it was so powerful. That's why some of us don't go on the mission field. Who wants to take off for a week from work and spend $2,000 when I want to get those new Gucci shoes? I, I want the Yeezys. I don't want to really spend money on transforming Honduras and Peru. I don't really want to go to people but it's the inconvenience that causes the miracles in us. So a live conference is supposed to be inconvenient. That's why we see miracles. A live leadership institute. Who wants to give every Monday night and sign up for two years of book reports, case studies, and to hang out online? I want you to know that if you're called to be a leader, you got the call of God on your life, you know where you should be. A live leadership institute, Monday and Tuesday, inconvenience in yourself because God is not a God of convenience. He's a God of inconvenience. Growth track. Growth track is inconvenient on purpose. You telling me that you're asking for the people that come to this church who sit through your long message to go and sit through another one? Yes. That's exactly what we're asking to do. And if they do what we've been preaching for them to do, they will see miracles happen in their marriages, miracles happen in their mindset. Come on, somebody. Because miracles are always birthed out of inconveniences. 
And so some of you guys are called to lead a small group, but it's not in your schedule. He wants to blow up your schedule. Some of y'all are called to get into counseling. Your relationship is tore up. You better make time for counseling. Do you understand what I'm saying? He is the God of inconvenience. Giving is inconvenient. You want me to tithe and give offerings? Yeah. December 5th, Super Sunday is coming up. Those of you all online, wherever you are in the world, you can sow towards our annual Heart of the House giving that we call here on December 5th. And every once in a while, there should be pain in the offering. If you are the person that you've been giving and it don't cost you nothing, Cain and Abel, one of them offering was cool and one of them he rejected because the one he rejected, it didn't cost them nothing. I came from old school church where they pass out the plate for the first offering and then you walk around and march for the second offering and I would give a quarter in the first offering and a dollar in the second offering. But I'll be at the club the night before making it rain. I'm talking about hit the bar, play the store. I got 20 on that. I want a white Russian. Come on, somebody. Sex on the beach. I'm going to take her. All them people right there. All them getting in VIP. Come with me. But then we come to church and we tip God because we don't want to be inconvenienced. But fire falls on sacrifice, Joshua. Fire falls on sacrifice that I give up something of value for something I deem to have greater value. I'm going to sit down because I don't know if y'all was ready for this one on this cold Sunday morning. So we're asking those of you all who love this church to get ready to be inconvenienced on December the 5th, and we're going to see what God's going to do. I got to go. 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says, preach the word. Go ahead and tell somebody around you it's time for you to preach that word. <laughs> preach the word. Go ahead and get somebody that you don't know as well behind you. Tell them you got to preach the word. You got to... I'm not saying you got to Bible thump people, but God knows you got to open up your mouth and preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right, even when it's not. That means be instant in season and even out of season. Keep your sense of urgency, saith the Lord. Whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, Boy, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient. I love John chapter 4 because we've been looking at the Samaritan woman and how she had the spirit of evangelism. I think this week we need to look at Jesus, who was weary by the well, but he still shared his faith. It is an inconvenient cross and an inconvenient gospel with an inconvenient God that says, I don't care that she's a Samaritan. I don't care that she's a woman, and I don't care that I'm weary. Watch what's about to happen. I got three next steps for you. We'll be done. I'm all about next steps. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Because sometimes you can hear great messages, but now the question is, what will you do with what you've heard today? Yes. Say this with me. It's the, it's the doers. Say it with me. It's the doers, it's the doers. Of, the word of the word that will be blessed. How many of you all want to be blessed? Let me see by a show of hands. You can't hear this. You have to apply this. Here's three next steps I want you to prayerfully consider doing. Number one, do something for God this week that is an inconvenience for you. Okay? For some of you guys, it's just joining Growth Track. So right after every service, if you're not on a team, if you're saying, okay, I want to make this my church home, your next step is Growth Track. So I'm expecting about 22 of you guys to take that step into growth track today. You say, Pastor, I was going home to watch football. I want to inconvenience you today. And I want you to, what is it, TiVo it? Record it. It'll be there when you get there. Or Sports Center, right? Number two, I want to ask you to pray and ask God what you should give in this year's Super Sunday. Don't wait until the week before, say, oh, I, was, I just waited too late. I could have I could have gave. No, think about it this week, 30 days out. God, how are you trying to stretch me this year? What do you want me to do to end my year in faith? And last but not least, number three, share your faith this week. Invite, bring somebody to church with you next week. And um, if you're able to lead somebody to Jesus, jump on the app, jump on the website, share that name, share that story. We change the world by changing your world. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you for every person that's here today, that we won't just be hearers of the word, but doers of it, because it's the doers of the word that shall be blessed. Since revival fires in this place. And I want to pray for the person who's here today, and you say, Pastor Ken, you don't know what I've been going through. You don't know how hard life is right now. You're in a really tough position, relationally or financially. Our God is a God of the breakthrough. 
And instead of you muscling things into the end zone, God is asking you to surrender your heart, your mind, and your actions to him. And uh, I believe he's going to turn things around for you because there's more working for you than against you. Whoever that's for, I want you to receive that today. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your heart to Jesus. He's not a tall tale. He's not a fable. He's not a made-up God. He's changed so many millions and billions of people around the world and the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers lest the light of the gospel shine through and God has you in this place and watching this online right now because he wants to reveal himself to you but here's the key you first have to take a step towards him and when you do that I believe he's gonna take two towards you so the ball is in your court you say why wouldn't God move first because he already did through the cross he already did through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. Now the ball is in your court. You don't have to be perfect to be forgiven. You just have to surrender. And I want to pray for you today. If you're here and you're like, you know what, Pastor, I want a relationship with Jesus. If you're here and you can admit that you've ever sinned, ever fallen short of the glory of God, and you want your sins to be forgiven, it's just a simple prayer asking Jesus to come into your heart. And so if that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and just wave at me. Then you can put it down so that I can know who I'm praying for. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, that is me, would you please pray for me? Yes, I would, but I want to know who I'm praying for. On the count of three, lift up your hand. One, two, three. Lift it up high all over the building and say, include me in that prayer. I see your hand and 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 your hand. And those of you all who are online, no matter what nation you're in, if that's you, I want you to text the word saved to the number on the screen or put it in the chat and somebody from our prayer team will hopefully reach out to you but I want you all just to pray this prayer after me salvation is a belief and a confession meaning that I believe that Jesus died for my sins now I'm going to confess or say it I'm gonna turn from my sin I'm gonna put my faith in Jesus nobody prays alone let everybody pray together today if you're ready say this with me say Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. come into my heart today Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I'm yours in your mind. Lord Jesus, thank you for salvation, wholeness, healing, deliverance, and eternal life is all mine right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.